introductions. It is now time for member statements. The member from uh, Simcoe North. Mr. Speaker, as the PC critic for education, I want to take this time to remind Ontario that today, when you cast your ballot, remember to vote for your school board trustee. Education is such an important aspect of all of our lives, and I want to stress how important our school board trustees are. I don't want the trustees to be lost in the race. They represent a very significant aspect in our children's lives. There's a general lack of understanding about what trust trustees do, given many decisions on education now come straight from the province. And in this election, in particular, trustees are competing for attention with some very high-profile races. The position sees the lowest voter turnout of all electoral races. For people who have children in the system, it's important because these are the people who are providing leadership in your schools, helping to focus on school success, and they influence how the system responds to issues and concerns, and they are working with individual families trying to solve problems. I want to remind everyone to get out to vote today, and I want to thank all of the trustees who put their names forward right across our province for these very important positions. Thank you very much. Member statements. Member statements. The member from Niagara Falls. Mr. Speaker, I spent the entire summer, day in and day out, meeting with every community group in my community that wanted to meet. Sometimes it was at my office. Other times it was at places where they serve, Niagara most in need. I toured Project Shared Food Banks and Nova House Women's Shelter. I met with our local social assistant workers in their own offices. I did this because my riding, it's clear there are people who need help. Niagara has been hit hard by the economic downturn. People, and through no fault of their own, they've lost their jobs. Some of them needed it and still continue to need a helping hand up. However, what I hear from these community groups was exactly the same. Since 2008, the need has gone up, but the funding has gone down. Shelter beds are full. I've seen it. Our local women's shelter is filled with children and women to its capacity. Food banks are running empty. Transit vultures are being eliminated. When people have their gas or electricity turned off, they have nowhere to go. The community groups in my riding are unanimous. Niagara is a large region. We don't want special treatment, only the funding that the region deserves based on its size. Hamilton's population is roughly the same as Niagara, yet Niagara receives around 20% of the funding that Hamilton does. I hope the Premier and the government will take the social needs of Niagara into consideration when they implement their budget. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Member statements? The uh, member from Cambridge. Thank you, Speaker. In my riding of Cambridge, we have a unique and positive resource for women who have experienced domestic violence or abuse and are taking positive action to improve their lives by leaving their abuser, most often leaving with their children. Of course, the life-changing resource I'm talking about is the Women's Crisis Services of Waterloo Region, an incredible organization that significantly impacts the lives of those who need its shelter. Women's Crisis Services operates two residential shelters, Haven House and Anselma House. In September, Haven House officially launched their rebuild project with an edgy She Deserves It campaign, which has great support amongst the many partners in the community. Speaker, these statistics are surprising. Last year, 92 women and 92 children were housed within Haven House for a total of 9,989 days of residential care. Without Haven House, these women wouldn't be able to flee abusive and negative relationships, resulting in possible damage to them and their children, physical, psychological, economic and social, which can be catastrophic. I have pledged to support this rebuild project because it's quite literally saving lives and ensuring a future where other, otherwise there may be none. I would be remiss if I didn't thank the hard-working and dedicated staff of Haven House, including the Executive Director Mary Zilney, whose tireless efforts are a testament to the kindness that can be found in our wonderful riding of Cambridge. Thank you. Thank you. Member Simmons, Member from Lampton, Ken Middlesex. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. Ontario's construction industry employs over 400,000 workers, roughly 6.5% of Ontario's total workforce. Construction is also the single largest investor in apprenticeship training. Many of these people are from small and medium-sized businesses and firms. The construction industry is unique in how employees get paid 
and delinquent payment in construction is a growing concern. Trade contractors and subcontractors bear a significant financial risk and are commonly made to wait periods of three to four months for payment after work has been completed. 90 days is typical, and we even see various levels of government not paying in a timely way. Delinquent payment strains cash flow, especially for small businesses that still have to meet payroll, taxes, WSIB premiums, and other costs. Payment limits, late payments uh, limits employment growth, ultimately means fewer jobs for Ontario workers and less investment in new machinery, equipment, and technology. Prompt payment legislation requires payment be made for all work certified as being completed within 30 days. As a small business owner, prompt payment is something that I strongly support. Quite simply, if you do the work, you should get paid. Already, the majority of U.S. states, the U.K., Ireland, the EU, Australia and New Zealand have adopted prompt payment legislation, and I'm calling on this government to act now to protect small and medium-sized businesses and those they employ by ensuring prompt payment is required in Ontario's construction industry. Thanks. Thank you. The member, statements, the member from Nickelbelt. Thank you, Speaker. Today, I want to talk to you about Kylie Jewers. Kylie is five years old. She lives in Lively, in my riding, with her parents, Lee and Jose. Earlier this year, Kylie had a cancerous cyst removed from her back. Then, a mass began to develop on her lung. By now, she's had four surgeries and has begun chemotherapy. I'm guessing you know why we call her Super Kylie. All we know is that she has an extremely rare sarcoma that no physicians have seen before. Kylie will be receiving chemotherapy until at least January. She's strong, she's determined, and she's beating this. There's no question about that. It's as simple as that. The complicated part, or the problem, if you wish, is the cost. The cost of travel from treatment from her home in Lively to down here in Toronto, as well as the loss of income as her parents need to take time off work in order to care for Super Kylie. This is an ongoing battle that will be requiring many trips to Toronto for many years to come. So I urge everyone to support this family and is as easy as going online, type www.gofundme.com and, and click for Super Kylie or she's ES462S. They're hoping to reach $20,000 and I'm really proud to say they're more than halfway there. With your support, they will make it. Thank you. Thank you. And the famous member from Mississauga, Brampton South. And Mr. Speaker, on Wednesday, October 22nd, I, together with our Premier, Honorable Kathleen Wynn, had the pleasure of attending an event organized by the Peel Dufferin Family Catholic Services to honor former Premier Will Davis and his family. Bill Davis, Brampton's most famous resident, is now 85, but still full of life, humor, and optimism. His life, career, and legacy can be summed up in one word, statesmanship. A minister who oversaw a tremendous expansion of our public education system, including the TV Ontario. A premier who cared about all, including the marginalized and less fortunate an executive who could make decisions tempered by deep thought, common sense, and balanced traditions with modernity. An Ontarian who worked for national unity, and most importantly, a man who was a good speaker, but better listener and the best doer. As for myself, I admire Bill's essential decency, humility, and indeed humanity. Mr. Davis serves as a role model for the kind of politics that we all need, regardless of one's own political affiliation, the common good of all Ontarians. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The United Nations has declared October 11th as the International Day of the Girl Child to recognize girls' rights and unique challenges girls face around the world. Gender equality is a basic human right as well as the cornerstone of global development. Research shows that investing in girls can impact not only the lives of young girls, but also benefits the economic growth and the health and well-being of our communities. 
This day is also an opportunity to advocate for girls around the world who face serious challenges in their daily lives, such as hunger, poverty, and limited access to education. Girls throughout the world, including here in Canada, face higher rates of violence, poverty, and discrimination. Girls and young women are nearly twice as likely as boys and young men to suffer certain mental health issues, such as depression. By investing in girls, we invest in our future. Equal opportunity for girls is good for all of us. This year, the International Day of the Girl provided an opportunity to recognize those we are inspired by and their important contributions, like Malala Yousafzai. In against incredible odds, she has shown courage and determination in the face of constant threats of violence. The world has taken notice of this incredible power a girl like Malala can have on her country and on the rights of girls around the world. At 17, she is the youngest winner of this year's Nobel Peace Prize and the sixth person ever to receive honorary Canadian citizenship. On International Day of the Girl, we took the time to celebrate girls and young women in our communities and what that means for our future here and around the world. Thank here, you, here. Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Member statements. Member's statements. Member from Burlington. Thank you, Speaker. I rise today in the House to celebrate meaningful progress on transit infrastructure in my riding of Burlington. This week, approximately 70 new parking spaces will be made available at the Aldershot GO train station. Okay. As a daily GO transit commuter, I know how hectic the morning rush can be. No one wants to miss their train because they've had to circle the parking lot looking for a spot to leave their car for the day. These 70 additional parking spaces will help to alleviate congestion and make it easier for commuters from Burlington and the surrounding area to get where they need to go when they need to be there. They will also enhance transportation choice, giving daily commuters a wider range of options beyond their car. Speaker, infrastructure is the backbone of our economy. This government's commitment to building Ontario up by investing in public transport, transit and transportation infrastructure is critical to easing congestion, improving our quality of life, and planning for the needs of future generations. While these new parking spaces are only a small part of the Greater Toronto and Hamilton Area Transit Agenda, it's proof that the plan is already in action and that we're benefiting from the results today. Over the next 10 years, constituents in Burlington and across the GTHA will see improvements in GO Transit rail service and public transit to ease congestion, support economic development, and improve mobility throughout the region. Along the way, I look forward to celebrating many more small but important milestones that together all add up to a province on the move. On the move. Thank you. Thank you. Member Stevens, the member for Etobicoke Centre. Etobicoke Centre is a wonderfully active community boasting some excellent sporting facilities and some wonderful organizations that continue to draw some of the world's top athletes to our community. Just this August, I had the opportunity to join the Etobicoke Lawn Bowling Association at the opening ceremonies of the Canadian National Junior Lawn Bowling Championships. This event, hosted just steps from my constituency office at the Etobicoke Lawn Bowling Club, brought together the best from across Canada, Mr. Speaker, and highlighted just one of the fantastic organizations and facilities that we boast within our community. In September, I joined participants at the annual Terry Fox Run at West Dean Park, where members of the community have applied their love of sport and running to raise money for this fantastic cause, raising over one, mil raising over $1 million towards cancer research to date, Mr. Speaker. And next summer, Etobicoke will once again welcome the world to our doorstep when the city hosts the 2015 Toronto Pan Am and Para Pan Am Games. During the Games, some of the world's top aquatic athletes will be in Etobicoke Centre as they prepare for their competitions at the Etobicoke Olympium in the riding of Etobicoke Centre. Now, Mr. Speaker, one of the best examples of one of those athletes and those swimmers is Etobicoke Swim the Etobicoke Swim Club's Brittany McLean, the 20-year-old Silverthorn Collegiate graduate, who at the most recent Glasgow Games won two medals, Mr. Speaker, and smashed her own Canadian uh, record. So, Mr. Speaker, I, I look forward to welcoming the athletes of the world to Etobicoke Centre next fall, and I congratulate the many organizations and athletes who promote sport, fitness, and health within my constituency of Etobicoke Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The member from Durham on a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It gives me great pleasure to introduce students from Dr. Emily Stowe Public Elementary School in my lovely riding of Durham. Welcome. Thank you. 